Hi everyone and welcome to Umbarist does the complete roguelike tutorial. Yes, this week and for the next couple of weeks is going to be a little bit special. I'm going to be following something that happens every year on the uh, roguelike dev channel on Reddit and it's a tutorial on how to make a roguelike in Python using libtcode. The community there is really amazing, it's a really friendly community and there's no pressure or anything. The idea is just to follow along and try your best and learn something new in the process. So if you're familiar with uh, libtcode or Python and you want to try something else like Java or C++ or Rust or whatever, well, you're more than welcome to try it out, follow along and post your progress on the subreddit. And maybe it's going to be a good introduction for all of you to programming in general. I'm going to do my best to make it interesting. The way it works is that the tutorial is divided into sections and I'm going to try to follow the schedule that's been posted on Rug Like Dev where they try to do about two sections every week. The first part is aptly titled Part 0 because it deals with just setting up your environment. It talks about how to download Python and how to set up your environment, what editor to use to edit Python scripts and such. But uh, to be honest, I'm not going to be following this part very much because I already have something all set up. I have to mention that the latest version of Python is 3.8, but my environment is running over 3.5. And the reason I'm using my own environment and not the latest Python is that a while ago, like a few years ago actually, I spent days trying to set up an environment that would be portable that I could bring around everywhere I go and then just works with all the libraries already installed that I use like NumPy or sklearn or stuff like that. And it's public on my GitHub, so you can just download the project and you're going to have a shortcut to start Notepad++ with all the right configuration. And all you have to do is open a script, hit F5, and it's just going to use the Python that's installed together with Notepad++. You don't need to install anything. You don't need to set up anything. Normally, it just work as is. So try it out and let me know how it works for you. So let's just jump straight into the tutorial. The first step is creating a folder for the project and installing uh, libtcode because I don't have it in my environment right now. Now, hopefully, if you just click on the link, it's going to tell you that for Windows, it's very simple to set up. There's something called pip on Python that you can just use to download any uh, libraries that is compatible with Python. So it should be just plug and play. Of course, when you're setting up your environment, it's never that simple. So, for example, this time when I tried to download a libtcode, I was met with an error that pip was out of date. This is pretty common when you're setting up a project. Even if there's hundreds of other people using it, you will always run into problem when you try to set it up on your machine. You just have to, you know, Google the errors and do your best to try to figure out the problem. Thankfully, pip throws an error but also tells you how to fix it so I just entered the comment to upgrade pip and everything worked fine and I managed to install libdcode. So let's go back to the tutorial. First they suggest creating a simple script that's going to test everything is set up properly. So I created the engine.py file, I opened it in notepad and copied the basic skeleton of a python script. Now the most important part here is making sure that the import is working which if you look at the console, will show you that it's not working in my case. Like any good programmer, I just quickly Googled the error so that someone else could tell me what was wrong with my code. And I quickly found the answer in some forum. Apparently the latest version of libtcode has some code that's only supported in Python 3.6. Now I could have updated Python, but like I said, it took me days to set up my environment so that it's portable like it is right now, so I was quite hesitant to try to do it again. So I figured I'd check the release list and see if there isn't an older version that would be compatible. I figured that since the doc still says that it's compatible with 3.5, it must be a very recent change. So maybe I can go back to like just one or two version and everything's gonna be fine. So Maybe this is a little bit complicated, but what I did is I cloned the project on GitHub and I ran the blame on the line that was crashing. Thank God for open source, right? And then this told me exactly when the change happened, April 28th. So I went back into the release list and I looked at what released was the latest before April 28th. And I uninstalled the 
latest version of libtcode and I reinstalled with the version that was before April 28th and everything is working fine now. So I'm just going to stick with the version that I have right now. Okay, so now everything looks like it's working fine. My environment is set up properly. The last step in part zero now is just downloading the font file that we're going to use to display our characters for the game. Now the tutorial doesn't specify anywhere to download it, I think they just download it in the root folder, but I really like to put my data into a data specific folder just so that all my binary files and stuff that's not source code is separated from everything else. So that's why I'm going to create a data folder and just put the PNG in there. Now if you look, the tutorial goes on a little bit and they explain a little bit how they're going to be displaying the code and, and that they use the standard diff format to display the differences between two versions because we're going to be refactoring often the same code. And um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory and if there's something you don't understand or it's not clear, I'm very familiar with the diff file format so I don't have any problem with it. But if you have a question or something, just ask me in the comment and I'll be happy to answer but I think for the most part it's going to be pretty clear. So we'll just skip a little bit this part. And now part zero is complete. The project is set up. Our environment is set up. We're ready to go to part one. Now part one deals with actually initializing libtcode, creating a window for our game and displaying our very first character. Now since Python is a scripting language, it's perfectly fine to write code directly in the file without any method declaration or classes or anything like that. And it's just going to run as soon as you open the file. This is great, but it can be a problem if you have multiple Python files and you want to import only the method definition and not run script that's in the global scope. And the way you avoid these kind of issues is by putting all your global code inside this if underscore underscore main underscore underscore and this is going to ensure that the code is only going to run if the file is the one that launched the Python interpreter. If it's not, then it's going to just import the definition, but it's not going to run any of the code because it's going to be wrapped in the if else. This is basically the equivalent of a static main function in Java or C++, for example. And what you have there is the uh, static main function calling the actual main function of our engine that's going to run the for loop that's going to create our game. Now if you remember, I just said that I downloaded the uh, image for the font inside a data folder. I could of course just hard code it and then be done with it. But if you hard code slashes or backslashes in a file path in Python, you're going to run into issues if you try to run your script on something else like a Mac OS or Linux or something like that. So to avoid these kind of problem, you're better to use something called os.path.join. And to do that, you're going to need to import the OS library. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just importing OS and sys because there are two libraries that come with Python and that you pretty much have to use all the time. So I'm just putting them at the top. And then I'm using a little trick because in the past, I've had multiple version of Python installed for different project that I was doing for different clients. And I run into issues where I was importing the wrong library because the first place Python is going to look for it, a library is the path variable in Windows. And if you have multiple version of Python in your path, which you really shouldn't, but might happen if you have multiple Python installed, then it's going to take whatever is the first library that it finds. And it might not be for the version you're running right now. So I have this little trick that you can see here where I append the path to the currently executing Python so that I make sure that when it looks for a library, the first thing it's going to hit is the folder of the current Python implementation I'm running. This is just a nice little trick to make sure that I'm always importing the right library, even if I have multiple Python installed in my path or something. It's not really necessary, but it's just something I like to do. And I know a lot of people are going to re at me in the comments because I'm importing stuff I don't need. But honestly, I think there's some libraries that you are guaranteed to use at some point or another. So why not just import them right now and be done with it? I don't know. Personally, I don't really mind. I don't think it makes my code any slower and I don't think it's going to be any problem. And please don't look at my other projects because you're going to re even harder. Now you can see there's a couple of flags we passed beside the uh, texture for the font to set custom font. And it seems to tell libtcode that we want to convert the 
PNG into a grayscale so that we can change the color directly from the code. And also there's a layout flag that tells libtcode where each character is in our texture. Um, there's a couple of other choices like CP437, ASCII, and so on. But in this case, we're using the default libtcode um, layout of uh, characters in the texture. Now, if you're not familiar with game dev, all game engines always start with a wild true loop that's going to keep the program running until the player quits the game. And this is what we have here. We have a while. And instead of just while true, we check if the uh, console is closed with the uh, X button. And if we close the window, then the game is going to exit and the program is going to terminate. And that's basically what it is. The first few lines inside the loop is going to deal with actually displaying our at character, which is going to be our player. Now we're choosing to display it at, at one one, and then we use the command console flush. And this command, what it's going to do is that it's going to actually display the current frame that we just rendered. This is something called double buffering. It's very important in game development to avoid weird artifact when you're rendering. And basically what it is, is that you write everything you need to write somewhere in a texture that's called a buffer, and then you present it in one shot to the screen when it's ready to go. And then while it's being presented to the screen, you start working in the background on a new texture that's going to be displayed when you're ready and when you're ready for the next frame. As a side note, vSync means synchronizing the presentation of the buffer to the screen refresh rate so that you can avoid any tear in the screen while you're rendering. And then at the end, we add a little check for the escape key. And if the escape key is pressed, we just exit the program. So that's a pretty basic setup. And then we can just try to run it. And then I ran into another problem with my environment because it seemed that libtcode doesn't really like running inside NPP exec console, which is a plugin that I use to run code inside Notepad++. And I tried running the script directly from a Windows terminal and everything was working fine. So it's obviously a, a problem with running the command inside Notepad++. So I tried to change my command so that it would launch a terminal and then run this command inside a terminal. So basically running a console inside a console. But this seemed to work fine and it'll make things much easier than having to alt tab between different uh, you know, the Windows console and the uh, Notepad++. That's the whole point I have Notepad++ with NPP exec right now is so that I can just hit F5 and run the game. So with this out of the way, we now have our little empty window with a single at mark that's going to be our player. And we can go back to the tutorial. We now have to make this character our player and make him move around with the arrow keys. So as I'm following along and, and adding the new lines for the player position, um, you might be wondering why I'm taking the time to type everything instead of just, you know, copy pasting the line from the tutorial. And the reason for this is that I like to type it myself so that I can think about what I'm doing while I'm typing it. And this way I remember and I learn more than if I was just blindly copy and pasting it. Now I stopped a little bit here because um, as I was following down the tutorial, there was this key equal libtcode.key and that confused me a little bit because I remember that we were already using a variable named key and I was a little bit worried we were overwriting the key later in our code and I didn't understand how this all fit together and then these kind of issues I've had before and you're reusing the variable and you forget that you used it somewhere else in your method and then you end up with weird errors that takes you days to debug. So I wanted to make sure I understood what was happening and then I saw that this line is going to be removed a little bit later in the tutorial so I just kept going but even then I still prefer to put it into comments so that I'm not confused later on. Now the next step is adding more handlers for the key presses. Now right now we already have the escape key to quit but as everyone knows, roguelike really love their keyboard shortcut. There's always a million different actions and all the keys on the keyboard are usually used for good roguelike. So it's probably a good idea to list all of those key combination in a separate file dedicated to input handling so we don't end up with a million line of code inside our main loop, right? It's just good practice in general. It's just going to make finding your way inside your code easier at some point. So we create a new file called input handlers and we just start adding the 
code for handling the keys for the character's movement. The tutorial goes into quite a bit of detail about what each line is doing, but I think it's pretty obvious. All you need to know if you're not familiar with Python is that this bracket thingy that we're returning at the end of each if statement is a dictionary. And you can really cr easily create dictionaries and arrays on the fly in Python, which is really useful for passing data structure that you create on the fly between methods and objects of your program. And for example, in this case, we basically check each keys and then we create a dictionary of action that correspond to the key that we pressed. And the reason we're doing something like this is that later when we'll add logic and we'll have alternate keys for movement, for example, we want to use the arrows, but also to be able to use the numpad or something like that. Well, instead of having all this logic inside the main method, then we can just return the same actions for all the different alternate keys and then have the code just handle this action without knowing how it was actually triggered, which means we'll even be able to uh, trigger it with an AI or something that decides what action it wants to take without actually receiving a key press. So that's why we're creating this kind of um, separation between the action and the keys. Even eventually, since it's a dictionary, we would be able to return multiple actions in one go, which could be useful later on, but I'm not sure we're going to get to that point. I don't know. I haven't looked at all the tutorial yet. Now, after we've added all the key parsing and we return all our values for the actions, we go back into the engine and we um, set up how we handle each di different actions that we've added. You might see that I'm getting an error here because it's saying that we don't have the handle input methods because just like in C++ where you have to include files that you want to use in your program, then in Python you have to import files to be able to access the methods defined in them. So in this case, instead of importing the whole file, we're just importing directly the method we want, which is handle keys. And then we hit F5 and voila, we have a character moving on the screen. Okay, it, it seems like there might be a little something wrong, but I am sure the tutorial is going to fix that somewhere down the line, right? Okay, so now the next step is creating a new console instead of using the default console. Now the way I understand this is that each console are basically kind of render textures where you can render different characters, different text, and when you want to display these console or this texture, you just copy them into the uh, render buffer that is the default console and then you flush everything to display it like we talked before. Now copying one texture into another texture is often referred to as a blit operation and that's why the next line says console blit. This is because we're basically copying the result of one console into another console and then when we want to display it, we just use the flush like before. Why have this extra layer console instead of rendering directly in the default console? Well, I guess it's because when we are going to have menus like the inventory, for example, of the player, then we're going to be able to just blit this console inside the texture only when we want to display the inventory. And when we don't want to display it, we don't have to like erase it or completely destroy it or something. We just don't blit it every frame and then it's just going to be invisible. So it's going to be a good way for us to have multiple console for each different UI element we want to display. And then whether we want to display it or not is just decided by whether or not we're going to blit this onto the main console, which is going to make our life much simpler. Now, as I'm following the part about uh, refactoring everything to use a different console, I noticed there's another put car line that puts an empty space where the player is after everything has been flushed. And according to their diff, it's replacing a previous line, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't there before. But anyway, this seems to make a lot of sense considering the little problem we had the first time we ran the code that moves the player around. So basically the text was set, but it isn't cleared every frame. To clear it, we have to write an empty space before starting the next frame. And since we've already done the console flush, this is never going to be actually displayed until the next console flush. And by that time, we're going to have done the loop again and we're going to have decided where our player is going to be rendered. So that's how the player is going to be moving around the screen without leaving a trail behind like before. And now we have it, our player is moving around like a champ. Okay, so now the last but important step is backing up our project on GitHub. 
Even the tutorial says so. But that's really awesome because just recently actually I've made a complete tutorial on what is GitHub, how GitHub works, what is Git and why you want to use it and what's the difference between GitHub and Git and what tools you should use to back up your stuff and all that. So I really suggest you go and check it out. I'm going to put a link in the top here. But for now, let's just create a new project on GitHub, init the repository, add everything inside it, commit it, and then add the remote GitHub repo, sync everything. But oh, if you look at the result, you can see now that I didn't check when I committed everything and I committed the PY cache by mistake, which is not really necessary for running the Python. So I'm just going to quickly add a little git ignore to tell it to ignore the py cache folder and then I'm going to delete it from the repository, push again everything and now everything should be fine and there's no more chance of me committing the binaries by mistake. And this is part 0 and part 1 of the complete roguelike tutorial and we're done for this week. Next week we're going to be trying out part 2 and part 3 so stay tuned, stay safe and bye!